April, the Situation Room gets into its second hour this morning and welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. All right, we're getting into um, a conversation with the new president of the Law Society of Kenya. She is here. The last time she was here, she was not president. Today, she is. Faith Odhiambo is the president of the Law Society of Kenya. Madam President, good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Very good to see you. Good to see you as well. I, I want to say that you look different, but you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just that now you have a, a new title. Your smile might just be slightly broader. <laughs> yes, nothing has changed really. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Good to see you all the same. And Karibu Sana. Asante. Uh, in the hot seat this morning. Um, this week, CT went to Cape Verde. That's where the proverbs are from this weekend. He has a very interesting one today. Uh, over to you, CT. You can tell us what you think about it. Okay. Uh, the day's proverb from Cabo Verde. That's Cape Verde in Portuguese. An aging man gets closer to his land, and an aging husband gets closer to his wife. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I think it's more of going back to the roots. Yes. Um, as time, as you grow older, you understand the importance of home and uh, of giving back to the society. And I think as an aging man back to his wife, I, I, or closer to his wife, I'd say that you realize options are limited. Now. <laughs> <laughs> You'd rather stay with the one that you are. <laughs> with um, Cape Verde is a beautiful um, small country but a beautiful one so I think that proverb is quite befitting I would say that as time goes by even if you look at it in a broader perspective as we grow older we realize the importance of our nation of our country mm. of just protecting um, what we have for the future generation um, and that's why I would say you go back to your roots mm. you remember what's important we had uh, frolics when you're younger as you grow older you mm. realize um let's go back to where we started mm. yeah <laughs> interesting so i mean many things are happening of course we'd like to see what you, it is that would happen would you'd like to do with lsk as we go into you know the next year or so but uh, let's look at lsk right now in line with what is happening around the country at the moment one of the big things is this is the is the doctor's strike um and legalities or illegalities and saying that well here's a body that um, is tasked with a number of things in society today and if we talk about legalities and illegalities let's just kick off with some of the issues that we are seeing currently um in the country and uh, maybe hear what role then the LSK would play in all of this and what is seen in terms of what is happening at the moment? I would say that what we are seeing right now is the doctors are fighting for what they believe is their rights under the CBA that they last signed vis-a-vis mm. -vis the question of um, whether their right to strike is beyond uh, right of essential services and I would say you balance it to what extent. Mm. Um, we have a country that is saying they don't have money for doctors, but they have money to increase mm. um, the salaries of members of parliament. They mm. have money to increase the budget mm -hmm. allocation of the second, uh, I, would say, I would say the DP's wife or the second mm -hmm. lady of the nation, mm. which is not even a constitutional office. So you create an office, um, then by virtue of the fact that you hold majority in parliament, mm -hmm. you push for it, then again you allocate a budget to it, and then you increase the budget. And I feel it's quite immoral if you even look at the kinds of the amounts that have since been added, particularly for the second lady. Mm. And then you tell us you don't have money to pay our doctors who provide basic essential services for this nation. Yeah, And so I, I would say it's a screwed... Uh, a skewed way of how we look at things and secondly we have now the council of governors saying on their end they didn't sign the cba and further they can't afford to pay for that cba in any event mm. um they are complaining also of how much they are getting from um, the national government but this question all also goes vis-a-vis -vis the question of the kind of corruption that is happening at the county so the question is 
what is more important um paying for essential services ensuring your people have basic health care mm. or the other activities that you're running then we have also the question from the national government that you cannot ping pong it and say this is the role of the counties and i would say tongue in cheek because now we look at the housing mm -hmm. levy and what's going on it's essentially the role of the counties for housing under the constitution mm -hmm. but the national government has taken over it and they signed that cba and i think they have to honor it or they ought to honor it for the people of kenya because as much as you say that it's important to house every kenyan how much important it is to ensure that your kenyans have basic health care mm -hmm. that they're able to live and survive on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. so in the nation that we live in it's only important if it's their priority mm. and i believe what the doctors are doing i stand uh, totally in support because they're also fighting for the future of the doctors to come because if you have having doctors that are not even getting internships getting paid for those internships how can you say that you must go and offer essential services if you cannot even break um pay for your bread and butter on a day-to-day -day basis so to what extent you're forcing me to offer these services and I'm not able to make it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you also question the interns that have gone through school. Yeah. When will they get through that training to be able to make it for the next doctors? Because as a nation, there has to be some planning mm. that we know that these are the next cohort of doctors that are coming up and the population is growing. So you cannot tell us that we have enough doctors mm. in this nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Where does this all fall? Because we've had... I mean, we read an article this morning about, you know, um, court saying, all of you need to sit at the table. We are now giving an order whereby you sit at the table, have this conversation. We have heard from the IG of police that, you know, what these demonstrations that you're doing, we don't want these nuisances around the city or around the towns where these are happening. We don't want that. Uh, we've heard from the CS that, uh, you know, first of all, um, the court has said that these kind of strikes are illegal how does the law the law now play when all of this and we're now saying the law vis-a-vis -vis rights that people have done been used that people are using actually to say this is the reason why you should go back to work well I'll, I'll, let me start with the law um well i agree that court orders should be obeyed and uh, by if the dinged of the courts is that they're illegal then then they should still appeal for that decision to allow them to go to, on strike but vis-a-vis -vis the rights of the doctors it's um enshrined in the constitution you have the right to association under article 36 uh, freedom on uh, right to picket peacefully of course under article 37 and I would say that what the doctors, they're enjoying their rights and they ought to be allowed to express themselves. Vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis, um, them sitting at the table, I agree they ought to sit at the table. And that's why I don't agree with some of the nuances and the hard stances that have been taken with the Council of Governors. Because if they, you know, when two bulls are fighting, it's the grass that you know feels mm. the pinch mm. so it's the if you go to the public hospitals and just somebody needs to do a survey of how many deaths or um in complications are developing over time because there's no adequate number of doctors to be able to offer services mm -hmm. to the people that are piling in those hospitals mm -hmm. how many lives are we losing on a day-to-day -day basis and so the reality is as they fight the question is who is hurting the most we need to think about the greater good and think about the people of Kenya. And that's why the Council of Governors need to come down and sit and talk to mm -hmm. these doctors. Mm -hmm. Because until you see the dire situations that some of them end up having is when you realize also they are human beings and they're going through challenges and struggles. Then we have the CS as well. I think she needs to get off her high horse and sit down and talk to the doctors mm. and try and agree on a way forward. Because... It is highly immoral, I would say, that you signed, those are CBA signed by the government. Then you say, now we are not going to be able to uh, live up to that CBA. You're not even trying to negotiate. And they had got, the doctors had agreed to, um, to go back to work after they signed that initial CBA. You have not made attempts 
to um, you know live up to that collective bargaining agreement now you're telling them we c we will not honor it we cannot honor it go back to work mm. there is absolutely no goodwill and i think both even the doctors need to tone down a bit maybe on their hard stances let them sit together and agree on possibly how they implement that mm -hmm. cba mm -hmm. it's only fair that we also ensure that they are paid well but at the same time we cannot have hard stances at the backstop of what is happening in our nation mm -hmm. you cannot say there's no money there's no money but there's money for other things so mm -hmm. the question is is healthcare not part and parcel of the important things mm -hmm. with regards to the ig i ask myself what is his interest the office of the ig should be an independent office to offer services to the people of kenya the doctors once they issue an, a notice i'm um, requesting to go on uh, to express themselves and strike i don't understand what is his um interest in getting involved in this um, dispute because he's not a court he cannot limit the right to strike of doctors mm -hmm. unless you he would say that there's evidence that they have been um, causing chaos so using the vuvuzelas does not amount to the standard that he should um, ask his officers to use any kind of force upon the doctors he he cannot assume the role of arbiter of the courts to try and give direction and say you will not go on strike i will not allow this i will not allow this what is your interest mm -hmm. you're supposed to be an independent office you're not supposed to join the side of the executive and that's the challenges that kenyans have faced over time and that's why we thought finally you'd have an office of the ig that is independent under the constitution but he continues to disappoint time over time by failing to exercise some level of um, independence. So are, you, are you saying essentially that uh, the IG then may be on, on puppet strings? Is somebody asking him to make these statements? We, that's, that's the hard question that we are asking him. Because you cannot enter into a dispute that you're not involved in. The question is, to what extent has your powers been evoked? Or, you know, you would say that the doctors have engaged in d destroying property or something like that. Then you'd say, I as the IG, I'm moving in to protect the members of the public. His responsibility as well is not only to protect the members of the public, but once a notice to strike has been issued, he ought to provide security. The doctors have shown evidence of goons being brought to mm. disrupt um, their strike. Why aren't you providing security for those doctors to, you know, exercise their right to strike peacefully they are not harming anyone they're not affecting anyone except traffic but of course we have seen strikes in this nation before and traffic is obviously affected mm -hmm. but as long as the doctors have not destroyed anyone's property they are not harming anyone physically on what basis what is your interest mm -hmm. in that strike and that is the hard question and we have since seen um, katiba has gone to court and gotten orders seeking a stay of his purported directive and i hope that he will take it seriously and obey those court orders mm -hmm. yeah. but, we, but we have a problem here all these independent offices that were created were created so that they would actually be independent but before we get to the independent offices let's go to parliament they have a constitutional role as parliament. They are an arm. They are supposed to ensure that they limit and they check the possible excesses of the executive. Now, if you have a parliament that seems to be dancing to the same tune as the executive, we are done for. Because who is going to check the executive? Because Everything we're seeing here seems to point to the executive because who appoints the IG? Now, Parliament is the one place where you can't say they were appointed. These are people who are individually elected all over the country. And yet, we are where we are. Because all these excesses we are speaking of, Parliament have always been in a position to actually intervene. They can. But on matters that are this serious, they're silent. One doesn't hear their voice, or unless they're speaking and it is me who has not heard them speak. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you. I'd say the tragedy that we face as a nation, particularly now, is 
we have a parliament that is pointing its fingers at the judiciary and we have an executive pointing its fingers at the judiciary yes. as well because you see parliament time and time on again overruling or trying to find loopholes to work around court decisions yes. in aid of the uh, executive yes and i would say the problem with parliament that they are not seeing their role as an oversight i think they're seeing their role as might is right and we have the numbers and mm. we will push for everything that works for us and i think the failure of this parliament they fail to see the general trajectory of things how it always happens today you feel like you have majority tomorrow you will lose that majority and then, then you then what? you then what and then you lose even that um credibility mm. even at all that you'd have had an um, impact i think as a nation parliament needs to rethink its role in terms of what as the heads the two heads the speakers of the two house guiding their members that at the end of the day we are supposed to be a check we're not supposed to be a rubber stamp what we are seeing more and more is more of a rubber stamp and i would say that even as a nation we don't even we barely see that we even have an opposition i would say that the challenge yes um the government has the majority in parliament but i would say that even as opposition they may be at a disadvantage but mm -hmm. something that they should be challenged is let them keep providing alternatives so that the record shows um that and the halsbury is that they continued to provide different solutions mm -hmm. and the the majority kept opting for this other kind of direction um it's sad we raise it we complain about it but unless the two heads realize um their important role that they play and how they can guide their members of parliament it's quite unfortunate mm -hmm. we keep seeing i was seeing um a photo someone was sharing yesterday a member of parliament at watch sleeping peacefully at at a meeting uh, in a session in parliament why because they have the majority there's nothing to be watchful about mm -hmm. maybe wake up <laughs> for the time of voting um and some and we were watching also the proceedings of the vetting of some of these um ambassadors and high commission and some of these rejected ones all of a sudden there was so much clamor mm. by some particular ones and the reasons that were being brought were quite interesting so someone was laughing and saying the power of the brown bag you can bring all reasons to support mm. and it's it's unfortunate but that's the kind of mockery um i think it it may reach a time that we start having um we should have a way to bring our members of parliament for questioning on what they ha and to account to us what they have been doing um the reality is as time goes by we will we we we, we what we are saying is like parliament has become an appendage of the executive they should be singing to one or reporting as one because what is the trajectory that we have been seeing all through mm -hmm. is that they seem to be singing from one end of course cuz they have the numbers yeah you know go ahead the um if i look at the history of the elsk over time long before we coined the term civil society mm. they played that role and uh, people who were at the helm of the lsk many of them rose to prominence simply because of the positions they took vis-a-vis -vis the government of the day and the excesses of that particular government now in this day and age i find that the thing that we keep complaining about with regards to the public understanding their sovereignty and what that entails is perhaps a clearer understanding of the law now every time an issue goes to court is an opportunity for us to be to be educated yeah. but the lsk in my opinion are in a far better position than even the judiciary when it comes to educating the public about their rights because right now those in power believe they are in power and they are but what they don't seem to understand is the temporary nature of these things none of these things are permanent they are all temporary and there are steps that will be taken there are laws that will be pushed through to serve certain interests but it serves your interest when you're in a position of power what happens when you have that same law and you're not in a position of power it will most certainly work against you but it'll work for that person who is in power 
Now, why am I raising this point? Because I'd like you to tell us what it is that you plan to do, what your master plan is as the president of the LSK. Because every president comes in with an idea of what it is they'd like to see. We'd like to know what you would like to see during your tenure as president. Now, during my tenure as president, there are things that I'd promised, of course, my members that we want to see. We want to see a review or revamp with regards to the challenges of corruption that we're seeing in the courts, as well as corruption in the lands registry. And uh, far, part of also the same is how can we make um, changes to make um, accessibility to courts and also at the lands office to members of the public as well as our members because if we are having challenges as advocates you can imagine the challenges that laymen are having but what difference as well that we want to do is I want to try and work closer with our members of parliament to offer alternatives particularly to try and review some of these laws and policies mm -hmm. and raise hue and cry to some of them because if you saw the colors nature even some of the finance when the finance bill was shared and uh, the members of parliament passed it later on they'd say that that bill was too big they were not able to read it the entire bill we want to work closely with them to keep offering an alternative voice um, to be able to share and also try and educate as much as we can particularly some of the bills that will affect members of the public most and we don't want to wait just until the time it's become an act that we go to court and trying to challenge the provisions but we want to try and work with them closely as they develop some of these laws and policies to also raise concern that some who may not catch um, the loopholes um, and the gaping challenges that may thereafter arise law society can try and support with that regard mm. Um, because at the end of the day, yes, we have a lot of our members there and we want to remind them that first they are lawyers and they have a responsibility um, to also serve members of the public. And as part of also the legal profession, they have a responsibility. Um, they answer also to the Law Society of Kenya. And so we'd want to work closer with them that we try and arrest some of these problems that we are having in the kind of policies and bills at an inception stage and st and, uh, instead of waiting until they come to become um, law. And we will do our part. I'm not saying that it's going to be perfect and they are going to see eye to eye, but mm. we will offer them that alternative. Mm -hmm. That is most important, that the law society has made its intervention. I would say that civic education is quite important. Unfortunately, that role that um, IBC used to take up, IBC no longer does civic education. And we will try our best, but I've realized something is that a majority of people are consumers on social media. Mm -hmm. And the, the reality is, unless we work closely with media as well, yeah. um, that will be a challenge in how we are selling and sharing this information. Sure. And the challenge that LSK is thinking of, how can we work closely with media and also share information and educate at the simplest terms? Mm. Because what this executive or this government has caught right, I believe, is how to sell information to the members of the public. Indeed. So by the time you're in court fighting for a against a certain directive, law, policy, the feedback that is on the ground of members of the public is that you're fighting the government as an opposition. Members of the public are not consuming the actual harm that will impact by virtue of any change in law and policy they do not understand it because it's been sold already to them on social media yeah. in, a, um, in a manner that evokes emotion i would even say a good example is the housing levy um someone was having a we were having a discussion with friends and yes. i was telling them the reality is if you listen to the message it's not for you and me the message is for the person in the ground that these people do not want you to own your home. Mm. You have an opportunity to own a home. So you're mm. evoking that emotion vis-a-vis -vis how do we sell also as we educate members of the public, public in a way that they understand. The Law Society of Kenya, it's wrapped up in a lot of, there's a lot of legalese. There, um, um, or even actions or activities that the, the society is mandated to perform. Right. And so for people who are saying, OK, so it's great. There's a there's a law society. Who is it for? 
Who is it for? Is it for them? Is it a legal club where all advocates can just be part of and then every now and then we see them hearing, we hear them saying something? Or are there elements of the society that are there then for the benefit of Kenya's people? How then do they access that information, plug into the society, activate some of those roles and mandates that you have for their information and benefit? Um, I would say that the Law Society is there not only for our members as advocates, but also for the members of the public. I would say that just last weekend, I spent both my Saturday and Sunday attending legal aids that were organized by advocates in Embakasi, one organized by advocates and Sitam Church, and mm -hmm. on Sunday um, as well, one organized in Moja too. Um, by free legal services um, by advocates at the church premises and we have eight branches around the country mm -hmm. and if you even see some of the statements we make with regards to challenging um, some of the policies that have been proposed and laws by the executive mm -hmm. is just looking at holistically how it's affecting members of the public mm -hmm. we have um, at our offices a number of members of the public who normally come to just look for legal aid and pro bono legal services to just support um, the challenges, particularly those who cannot afford um, a lawyer. So we do quite a bit of work mm -hmm. for members of the public in line with uh, our role under Section 4 under the Act. Mm -hmm. And so LSK is not just there for our members. We also work with the government as well. Um, we Our role is to advise. So I think something that would want to do particularly with this government is to sit them down and you know share as LSK our challenges it's not just to issue statements against them and for also them to sit down and listen mm -hmm. to the pulse of the people it's high time that um, even as the executive they embrace you know a different voice mm -hmm. it's it's a critic that is positive because we are looking at the work that you're doing and we are working with members of the public and it's high time that you sit down and just listen it's not just about criticizing you and telling you that you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong when you're right we will celebrate the government but when you're wrong expect us to tell you you're wrong mm -hmm. and it's quite important in a democracy in a democracy since you have so many choir members to sit down and listen to those who are not singing to the same tune of your choir because it'll, the critics help you sharpen and improve mm -hmm. um, some of the policies and things that you are seeking to do as government, which is quite important. It's good to look at that outside lens and say, well, LSK is saying no to this, and why are they saying no to this? And maybe what we hope to do is also provide where we can alternative propositions, because a lot of the challenges that we keep having with government is that we keep identifying where the law you're you know against the law mm -hmm. but instead of sitting down and restructuring and saying well they have highlighted one two three is against the law how do we sit and find ourselves within the law yeah then at that p particular position we would be together would be saying well you're doing the right thing so we will support what you're doing to the best end act as also a check to ensure that this service that you're offering to members of the public it's actually affected mm. um, so with regards to members of the public I would say that LSK does quite a bit of work yeah. uh, for members of the public the question is how much can we do um, with the limited resources and that's why I'm saying it's quite important that we work closely as well with the media because information is power and information is key and as a nation um, we have quite a litigious uh, nation in Kenya we have so many court matters always because once members understand that, uh, members of the public understand their rights, then they're able to quickly take action mm -hmm. with regards to the same. And so what we'd want to do is try and partner to ensure that we have more civic education to help members of the public understand what are their uh, rights and how can we ensure that uh, we work together to ensure that we protect the little that we have under our constitution? Mm. If you look at um, the political arena, anywhere in the world, the battle that always rages is for the heart of the people. That's the battleground. Now, this government is a government that the LSK could learn from because they focus on visibility 
and they are very visible. There are those who may smirk and say, but you know, they are, one wants to open a, a dispensary. Yes, it's visibility. One may want to cut a ribbon on a road that was completed, God knows. It's visibility. So every waking day, the public is in touch with the executive every single day. The LSK, we hear of them maybe on a weekend. And even then, we have the time we have no idea what they're talking about. Because by the time they're through with the section, there's an article, this, and it's 221, and you wonder, was it 231 or was it 221? So the public hears you, understands that you're trying to uh, get them to understand something else, but the executive resonate mm -hmm. better because they have understood the language that communicates effectively. Now, as we say, it isn't rocket science, but this is something that one can learn. How do you get to communicate legalese in a way that the public can understand it and understand it as something that is beneficial to them? Because the moment you see the benefit, you will move towards it. The idea of owning a house is a lovely idea. Lovely, lovely, lovely. It doesn't matter what people say, it is a wonderful idea. And if it's packaged and it is presented and the picture that is painted in words is like that, you can actually see yourself living in that house. Anybody else who says anything to the contrary, even if you are right, you will not be listened to. It's not complicated. Yeah. Now, the LSK, those of your members, you are referred to as learned friends, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, now that is going to be tested. How learned are you? Because you have members everywhere. You have members in parliament. You think of any sphere of our lives, you have members. Mm. So you cannot say you do not have the resource. The resource that is required is a human resource. You already have it. But then, on the other hand, you have members who represent you badly. When we talk about corruption in the courts, corruption doesn't corrupt itself. There are people, human beings have to participate in it. So there will be members of the judiciary who are inclined towards corruption. There will be people who are your members who are advocates of the High Court, who are inclined, who oil this particular process. And whether we like it or not, it's just something that we've taken as being normal in our country. So depending on the issue I have, I will look for a specific lawyer who is known in the public domain as a bagman for a certain judge. Mm. Now, these are just simple realities that we have. Yeah. How does LSK pull away and show that despite all these things, they have the interest of the public at heart because the interest that they have for their members is expected and is understood. But how does that benefit the public? Well, I would, I would say first of all is the challenge of speaking the people's language. Mm. Um, I would say that some of the greatest judges like Lord Denning, his language style, if you read his decisions, was simple, very simple English. Nothing complicated, no huge words, no Shakespeare just simple english and the next thing would be now to speak to the hearts of people yeah um it's it's an individual talent i would say that our head of state has an individual talent for how to speak to the hearts not everyone has that ability but i'd say it's a challenge that i've realized watching some of his speeches how he speaks to the hearts and not to the minds of the people and uh, that's a technique that we are picking up and we'll learn from it. Yeah, and I agree with you. We may not have the financial resource, but we have the human resource. Mm. And what LSK wants to do in part and parcel of our agenda in these next two years is also to deal with the question of corruption. Um, and not just at the courts, but it's true, the challenge that also to look within, because when you see a corrupt magistrate or judge, there has to be somebody who was involved in that transaction. Mm. And the beauty I always say is that in that transaction, there's always the opposite party who didn't get justice. And so they'll be able to identify and complain not only about that magistrate or judge, but the lawyer that was involved in that transaction. Mm. A challenge that we have had is how to make our disciplinary process um, more public, explain to the members of the public, make it more robust, 
and uh, ensure members of our, the public understand how can they get justice in event that a lawyer who is corrupt um, defrauds you so that they also are aware um, may, we, may, ways and means that they can ensure that they get justice against any corruption that um, may have got, they may have faced um, involving an advocate because we have to agree that we also have to look within and clean within other than just pointing fingers and that's something that we're ready to do. I pick up the challenge and uh, those are something that we'll be working on to ensure that we try and reach out as much as possible. The challenge that I will continue giving our members, particularly those in parliament, even in the executive, because we have quite a number of members mm -hmm. even in executive. But I think the moment you get a position of power, you uncloak the, um, the PF 105 mm -hmm. and forget that you are an advocate. And now you become um, a member sitting in cabinet, yeah. so you're a PS. Yes. Or now you uh, you have a position in parliament. You forget that what legal profession are you going back to? In fact, some of the challenges as I look at um, our members in parliament, I ask them as you continue to derode the role of the profession. Mm. I wonder what will happen five years down the line when you're not in favor of with your political party. You'll have this legal profession that you have to walk back to at some particular point. And also a challenge that has been raised that some of these judges or magistrates who are removed from office um, for corruption, they try and w they find their ways back to the legal profession. There has to be a way that we punish them as well, that they cannot now easily find comfort to come and corrupt mm. on this other particular side. So yes, I agree there are things that need to be done and we will start that process. But for our members in positions of power, I would like to remind them, you know, Oreng, now Governor Oreng always says that, you know, government eats its own people. Mm. They need to remember that quite well. We have seen instances when power changes, what happens. Mm. And so that's, that's a hard lesson that they must remind themselves. I keep saying um, Emeritus um, Chief Justice Willie Mutunga yeah. um, at an NCAG meeting, he reminded, he had members of parliament and cabinet secretaries were sitting in that meeting and he told them, you know, the former head of state kept saying that he will not obey court orders and their papers. The moment <laughs> he uncloaked his uh, presidency, he was rushing to courts to save his son. Mm. And so that is a stark um, reminder of the importance of the courts. <laughs> right. <laughs> how, how I, even as you mentioned that, I think one of the questions that then comes out is then how effective or how powerful then can lobbying that comes from a body such as the LSKB and would you be looking at activities whereby some of the things that we see basically swept under the carpet um, in society then are forgotten and I'm going to point directly to some of the things that come from the office of the Auditor General or the office of the control of budget with some of the things that we've seen where at the time I mean we just wrapped up a well not we but government just wrapped up um, a three-day conference on how to lower the wage bill, okay? But then we've seen that there have been queries, there have been excesses for years coming out of the Auditor General's office. We're not just talking about the person of Nancy Gadongo. Even before her, the office of um, uh, Eddie, Eddie Uko, m making certain statements about queries that have come up and not one, I dare say, not one of those queries has been investigated to the point whereby somebody then is liable and held accountable for the kinds of losses and mismanagement and misappropriation that we've seen to the tune of trillions of shillings over years. What role would the LSK have in pushing for some of these things to come true? Because here we are on one hand saying that there's so much loss that's, that's happening and you can actually see the chain, mm -hmm. but then nothing is done. Would the roles of the LSK play out here as well? I'd say yes. Um, it's to pick up some of these reports and try and pick up one or two causes to follow to its logical conclusion. 
will have the challenge of also pushing not only um, the ESCC but also the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution because these are two offices that ought to be independent. And once the Auditor General raises some of these queries and questions, I, I always say sometimes these public hearings in Parliament, they can be helpful and also they can fail to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, because you see them going through assemblance, mm. um, being asked questions, um, if they answer them well or they're able to tactically ev evade them, you see the matter is swept mm. under the carpet. Mm. Thereafter, we do not see recommendation for investigation by the director of public prosecutions mm. to ensure that um, he gets a proper file on some of these issues that have been raised, or we see the ESCC taking up some of these corruption cases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so as LSK will try and work closely, particularly with the ESCC and the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, mm -hmm. that some of these high cases, uh, high profile cases that are raised, we try and follow them up to their logical conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would say that as a nation, also, we have the role of media that I would push you, that you also have to play and support us in the same. Mm -hmm. That when we raise and highlight, the, it doesn't get swept up by the next news. As a, the problem we have in Kenya is that once the next succession comes up, everyone forgets what you are talking about. And so unless that information is raised continuously, mm -hmm. even if you're following up on the issue and it remains like it's a private issue, people ask, do you have a, public, a private interest towards that particular matter? So I think those are issues that we can continue raising together with the different stakeholders. And I call upon civil society as well. LSK can make, yes, a lot of noise. We can go to court. But some of these court cases, sometimes when you f make a lot of noise in the, in the court of public opinion, then we can start seeing action being taken because of pressure coming up from the members of the public. Mm -hmm. I think the voice of the people still remains the most important voice. And it's only when you see the, the disquiet, and I've been seeing some of the opinion polling. I attended... Um, a conference for opinion polling uh, recently and also bloggers and their space in uh, ensuring democracy and an independent voice of the people. And I think the reaction of government by virtue that their position in members of the public continues to dwindle and that's why we're seeing certain prices of certain commodities are coming down because the reality is Members of the public are also getting tired. Mm -hmm. um, as much as they may be goodwill, but if you continue seeing the weight um, is laid upon you more and more without any reprieve. And so I'd say, as media as well, if we could work together on certain endeavors, because it's a simple question of telling people, look at this is the corruption. If somebody is saying there's no money for doctors, if you took this money that is lost and we paid the doctors, would we have that money? Mm. We took some of this money, we used it and we paid for those houses that we're talking about. We could give them to you for free. Mm. And so it's to sell that message and tell and be able to collate to people what that corruption means with regards to if it was us. We say we don't have money for subsidies. But if that money that has been lost to corruption would have been used to buy these certain bags of fertilizer or these certain bags of maize for you, then what does it mean to you as a people, as a nation? And so also the information that we share needs to be co in consumable amounts that people we all talk about corruption but the problem with corruption um, is that what is corruption you need to s tell corruption as it is in the yeah. language people understand that mm -hmm. is theft I'm stealing from you what would have benefited you, you. in this other way mm. because everyone has their interest and the question is what is in it for me I will stand and defend my member of parliament if he tells me this is they're fighting me yes because i've stood against them or it's a fight against our people but if you sell to them this is theft money that could have been used to help you in this way mm -hmm. set up put up that bridge in in garissa that you'd be able to cross over tomorrow or this money would have helped you do set up that road that mm -hmm. would have been help you to get your wares from the farm to the market, mm -hmm. then you sell a language that the people can understand. Otherwise, telling people corruption, corruption doesn't make sense. Indeed. So, 
Are we looking at a year whereby a lot of these issues that we've discussed here, some of these elements, will actually come to life, whereby we're actually seeing this legalese broken down for Kenyans, for people to understand, to be able to consume, a real push for some of the things that would essentially be wrapped up in ignorance, actually brought to the fore and looking for um, um, prosecution of some of these things. Would we see that that would be more robust in this year under your leadership? Under my leadership, I'll work to ensure that we push for the same. And that's why as much as possible, I'm looking to work with different partners in civil society um, that you, you don't look like the lone voice mm. in uh, making, making the noise. Then you look like the madman in the village. But when you're working together with others and you're fighting a common cause, then it looks like you actually have interests of the members of the public at heart. Mm -hmm. And so under my leadership, that is what I hope that we'll be able to start and make that impetus um, towards that uh, direction. Fantastic. Um, Faith Odiambo is the president of the Law Society of Kenya. She's been our guest this hour. Always lovely to see you here. And we continue to have these discussions. Santisana. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day.